The lecture this morning deals with the history of evolutionary thought. The lecture is being presented this morning because the remainder of the week we're going to be giving a great deal of discussion to, the, to evolution in general, both as it compromises the Genesis account of creation and as it's causing a great deal of discussion and controversy in our land today. I don't believe that you can understand or cope with the concept of evolution unless you understand something of its checkered history. And if you're one of the people who thinks the minute you hear the word history that it's boredom time, let me assure you that in this area it is not that case at all. This is a checkered history, it's a very interesting history, and unless we understand the history behind it, the remainder of the concepts will not mean as much to you as they ought. As far as we can determine, the concept of evolution had its beginnings around 700 to 650 BC in the province of Ionia in Greece. Defining evolution as the development of the more complex forms from simpler forms, we begin our history with a Greek scientist by the name of Thales of Miletus, T-H-A-L-E-S, for those of you who need to know how to spell it. He lived about 640 to 546 B.C. He's well known because he first advanced the idea of what we refer to as a cycle of development. Now, I don't mean to leave the impression with you this morning that Thales was the one who literally invented the idea of, of evolution. Evolution, at least in some form, was known even prior to Thales. But he was the one who gave it some sort of at least definitive form, and for that he, he is recognized as one of the first to promulgate it in this form. He was born in Miletus of Ionia, and he traveled much into Greece proper, Crete, and Egypt. He was considered, and this is one of the reasons I even take the time to mention him to you today, as one of the seven great wise men of ancient Greece. He was the first to realize that the stars were more than just signs in the sky to be translated into some fantastic meaning. He founded the earliest school of Greek philosophers, and through this school he developed the concept of what we now know as geometry. He put it to practical uses, measuring such things as the heights of trees and buildings, determining the distances of ships at seas, and so on. He drew maps of the most noticeable stars in the heavens, something that no man before him had ever attempted to do. In 585 BC, he foretold, and I might add accurately foretold, an eclipse of the sun. And when this eclipse actually occurred as he predicted it, his fame rose second to none. It was because of that fame, through his astronomy and his predictions therein, that his concept of evolution became so important. Dr. J.B. Birdsell, in his book entitled Human Evolution, has stated that Thales was the first ancient to leave a record of an orderly approach to the interpretation of natural phenomena. He broke away from mythological explanations and expressed his belief that all life had originated in and rose out of the waters in the seas. That's the crucial point. Thales began with a single element, water. And he said that this water through long processes and an unknown mechanism turned into other elements, which then turned into the bodies of plants that then turned into simple animals and finally into humans. Thales said that many of these forms didn't make it. They fell back into this system, this cauldron to be rolled back over again, thrown out one more time to see if they could make it the second time, and a third, and a fourth. Thales' ideas survived, mainly through the students that he taught, one of whom was a man by the name of Anaximander, A-N-A-X-I-M-A-N-D-E-R, Anaximander. And I might mention that many of these concepts and names, by the way, are in the book that you have there, The History of Evolutionary Thought, which we've authored. He lived from 611 to 547 B.C. He believed in the existence of what we call a primordial mass. He felt very strongly that the earth had come about through some sort of condensation of water, but he took this further. He modified his teacher's concept. Originally, he said, the earth exist, consisted of mud, not water, but a mud-like slime which floated on the surface of a rounded sphere that was under a circular vault of sky. In other words, a giant mud ball. And this primordial mass, as he called it, perpetually gave off all kinds of shapes of matter which then turned into plants originally. And these then turned into animal forms of increasing complexity. And man, said Anaximander, came from the fishes originally. He said that his helplessness at birth was supposedly proof 
of his total inadequacy for any kind of terrestrial existence. Anaximander also felt that some of the derived forms were going to not make it go back to the primordial mass, which was eternal. And there's a clue, the eternality of matter. In the second lecture this morning, we're going to be discussing that in great detail because of these people who started the concept that matter was, in fact, eternal. Later, Empedocles, who lived from 490 to 435 B.C., from Sicily, said that there wasn't just one element. It wasn't water, and it wasn't mud. There were four essential elements that formed fundamental uh, plant and animal forms. He called these things earth, fire, wind, and water. He said these things formed as underground lumps or masses that then oozed up out of this earth concept that he had. And through some, again, unknown mechanism, just were pulled together to become parts of bodies that literally then formed themselves together on top of the ground to form uh, plants and animals and so on. He said that man had come from the plants, not the fishes. Now, all this may be a little seemingly irrelevant at the beginning, but believe me, it all ties in because the basic concepts you're hearing here are going to be lacking one thing and sharing several. They're lacking a mechanism. And as you're going to see momentarily, that's what made Charles Darwin so popular. They're sharing things like eternality of matter, no known mechanism, and so on. Democritus, who lived from 460 to roughly 370 B.C., is renowned for being what we call the first atomist. He formulated the idea that things are in fact made of atoms with empty spaces in between these atoms. But he also was more renowned, not just for the, his first concept of atoms, but for his basic concept of what we call pangenes, P-A-N-G-E-N-E-S. Pangenes, said Democritus, were considered to be these representative particles. Now this is important that came from all over the different parts of the body. They somehow migrated from the various parts of the body and were deposited in the male spermatozoa. When the male sperm cells were then deposited into the female during sexual intercourse, these little pangenes, one coming from the hand, one coming from the arm, one coming from the eye, then became in the system of the female, who was nothing more than a glorified incubator under this concept, the entire whole human. And the concept of pangenes reigned supreme for a long time. Aristotle was the one who came along and absolutely devastated it. And with nothing but just plain old Aristotelian logic. He said, if this concept of pangenes is correct, what would you expect when you had a fellow who had only one, uh, one arm who sired a child? Well, obviously you'd expect a child with just one arm. But everyone knows you don't get a child with one arm, you get a child with a full complement of two. So Aristotle said, where did the missing pangenes originate? Well, little by little, of course, this idea of pangenes, these little particles that came from all over the body, was proven to be wrong. As we find in later mentioning of Dr. August Weissmann, the German scientist who discovered where we have two kinds of cells in our bodies, somatic cells or body cells and germ cells or the sperm in the male, the egg in the female. And it was from those the genes were coming and so on. Aristotle has been called the greatest of all the Greek scientists. He lived from about 384 to 322 BC. He wrote books on just about anything imaginable, everything from poetry to politics, physics to astronomy and in between. He's most remembered, of course, for being the father of biology, the father of all living things. He was a teleologist, and this is a crucial point he did not believe that things just happened by accident. He believed there was a grand design. He believed it was the result of intelligent direction. He believed it was the result of a master plan of some kind. He said there was a purposive force that had made this primordial mass of living matter from which all these things came. Now, he didn't have a mechanism, and he was a sort, what you and I today might call a theistic evolutionist. He basically believed there was a great creator, a master designer, but he also believed that this evolutionary process took over once this original primordial mass was created by the designer. Augustine, who lived from 354 to 430 AD, was a literal theistic evolutionist. 
With Aristotle, there's some question. Some are willing to put him in the group of what we refer to as progressive creationists. But with Augustine, that's not the case. Augustine took many of Aristotle's views, modified them, tried to merge them with the book of Genesis and came out with a full-blown concept of what we know as theistic evolution, that God did create the earth, but he used a system of organic evolution to do so. Thomas Aquinas, and you can see we're hurriedly coming up this way. We're now at 1225, BC, uh, 1225 A.D. when he was born, 1274 A.D. when he died. He followed Augustine in his thinking and was, a, like Augustine, a full-blown theistic evolutionist. The influence these two men had on the early church cannot be underestimated or overestimated. You must understand these two men, Augustine and Aquinas, had a tremendous impact on the thinking of the early church in regard to the concepts we're discussing this morning. Now, during the Dark Ages, research and thought were stifled. But as the age of reason began to dawn, there was one man who came to shine as no others had shined. Doubtlessly, most of you in here have never even heard of him. His name was Maupertuis, M-A-U-P-E-R, T-U-I-S. He lived from 1694 to 1778. He was a physical scientist, not a biologist. He was the first man to prove that the earth flattens toward the two poles, a concept that we know today even to be true. He laid the groundwork for what Isaac Newton would do years later in the area of physics. But Maupertuis eventually ventured out into the field of biology as well. He investigated the concept we know as evolution, and note this. Look at the dates that he was born and lived, 1694 to 1778. That early on, he had a full-blown concept of what we now call natural selection. Almost 200 years before Charles Darwin ever came around to it. In fact, he had anticipated Darwin by well over a century. He also had a concept of what we now know as genetics, and but more than that even, genetic mutations. Therefore, anticipating Dr. Hugo de Vries, the famous Dutch botanist, again, by well over a century. He even recognized that these changes, these mutations, though that wasn't what they called them at that time, were, for the most part, harmful to the host. Why is it today, then, that you don't even recognize his name unless you've read the great history of evolutionary thought from beginning to end? Why is it we don't recognize his name? He had all these basic concepts that Charles Darwin and Hugo de Vries and other scientists would later develop, but no one knows of Maupertuis. If you read in his, of his name, you don't read it in the science textbooks under the history section. You read it in a history book somewhere in a little footnote at the bottom of the page. There's one reason, basically. He was a brilliant scientist. He had all these concepts that were years ahead of their time. But he had a tremendously influential enemy, Voltaire, the French agnostic and atheist. Voltaire took an extremely hateful attitude toward Maupertuis, a, an extreme disliking toward him. He wrote terrible things about him, lied about him, destroyed his reputation even during his lifetime. And Maupertuis was literally laughed to scorn because of the things that Voltaire said, and Voltaire was extremely influential. So today, you don't hear much about Maupertuis. He's long since forgotten, though he really plays a very important role in what we're about to discuss. Another gentleman who came to be very important in the early 1700s was Carl Linn, L-I-N-N-E. The Carl is C-A-R-L. You would, of course, know him today better by the name Linnaeus. He lived from 1707 to 1778. You probably know that he's the father of what we now call modern-day taxonomy. He was a Swedish biologist. He was the originator of what we refer to as our binomial system of nomenclature. That is, we give it a genus name and a species name, to use the human, for example, Homo sapiens. It was Linnaeus who originated that binomial nomenclature system using Latin as its base. His greatest published work was a work by the name Systema Natura, 
and why we commend him out of one side of our mouth for the tremendously influential work that he did in the field of biology, taxonomy, and systematics. We must criticize him strongly out of the other side of our mouth because it was Linnaeus who saddled those of us who are creationists with the false, the wrong concept of fixity of species. It was Linnaeus who said that the scriptural word kind used in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus should be directly identified with the biblical, with the biologist word species. And even today we find problems with that. Reading in a religious journal less than a year ago, I saw a writer who said that the, the fixity of species is true, that we know species are fixed. Well, species are not fixed. We know today species, which is nothing more than a man-made name given to a group already existing in nature, do change. We can change them in nature. They do change. And for us to say that species are fixed is wrong. Linnaeus was wrong. And the concept he gave us has haunted creationists for years. We've tried desperately to get rid of it. But even today, it's saddled with us in some, some even modern-day books. George Louis de Buffon, B-U-F-F-O-N, was a distinguished French natural philosopher and one of the, was one of the immediate precursors of Charles Darwin. Buffon was a lawyer by training. And folks, from this point forward, I'd like to give you a little clue of something I think is important. As you go through from this point forward, you're getting into what we refer to now as the beginning of modern-day neo-Darwinian thought. Notice some of the occupations of some of these gentlemen, because as I get to working through this, I'm going to call your attention to it after I've sort of given you several of them. I'd like you to see how the whole of evolutionary thought was developed and by whom it was developed. Buffon was a French naturalist. He was a lawyer by training. He wrote a 15-volume set of books that was entitled Histoire Naturelle, that is the French, of course, for natural history. He included in that multi-volume set essays on the theory of the origin of life, essays on the development uh, into an environment fit for living creatures, and in that work he made no bones about it that he flatly rejected the biblical account of creation. He wanted nothing to do with it, considered it wrong, thought stifling, and absolutely to be thrown out. Many historians have noted with great interest and I might add great interest, that in this 15-volume set of works are the pearls, the salient points of what Charles Darwin would propagate only 180 years later. I'd like you to file that away mentally for just a moment because in a moment I'm going to give you a quotation from Darwin where Darwin plainly says, I was the first to think it and no one else but me ever knew it. That's not right. And I'm convinced from my study in this field that Darwin knew that it wasn't right. And I'm going to give you a quotation from Dr. George Gaylord Simpson, who has been known for years in our country as Mr. Evolution himself, where he struggles to explain how Darwin could have gotten these things on his own without any help when all the people he was around and whom he knew knew all these things long before he did. Included in this 15-volume set are these four major points. I think they're important. Number one, the tendency of living things to outstrip their food supply. Now, if there are any of you in here who've read at all in the history of evolution, or if you've taken a course where this has been discussed, or if you take the time to read the little book that we've given you on the history of evolution, you're going to immediately recognize the name that I'm going to discuss just in a moment of Thomas Malthus. He's the, the minister, the British minister, who wrote an essay on population statistics that greatly influenced Charles Darwin. The concept was that living things outstrip their food supply. Buffon had that a hundred years before. Number two, that there are variations within species. Of course, what was Darwin's entire book called? The Origin of Species. Number three, that there was a similarity of structure among living things. A similarity of structure among living things. 
when we get into the lectures dealing with biological evolution in this seminar, that that is the strongest singular proof used even to this very day for evolution. And we're going to examine it in great depth, all the way down to the biochemical and molecular level. Number four, and I think this one is most interesting. Buffon noticed that there was a need for a longer period of time than the biblical chronologies would allow. He recognized the biblical chronology was much, much too short to occur, to allow to occur this that he was trying to get to occur. The next scientist of renown was a man, and I don't want you to try to write this name down as I read it off because you'll be here till next week trying to read off, Leopold Christian Frederick Dagobey Cuvier. You can write the last name down. That's really all that's important. C-U-V-I-E-R, Cuvier, 1769 to 1832. He was one of Napoleon's scientists, and in fact, he happened to be the favorite of Napoleon. Cuvier carried on the great work of Linnaeus, but even more important than that was the fact that he was, and note this, he was the first to make systematic studies comparing the remains of extinct animals, that is, via their fossils, with the structure of currently existing species. He studied those that were extinct by their fossils and compared them to those that were living, and for that he's today, today known as the father of the science of paleontology. But Cuvier is important for another reason. He's the one that thought that at several times in the past there had been great catastrophes, a sequence of catastrophes that wiped out living organisms all over the face of the earth. These creatures were destroyed by these catastrophes and then they were replaced by creatures that migrated in from other regions. He was known as the, the founder of this concept of successive local catastrophes. And that's the catchphrase by which his name is, is known. He was a creationist. He did not believe in evolution. And in fact, he devoted a great deal of time to refutation of evolutionary theories during his lifetime. But perhaps he's best known for the man that he trained. The famous British paleontologist and anatomist Richard Owen. Richard Owen lived from 1804 to 1892. He had a great yearning to go to sea as a ship's doctor, but that wasn't ever going to end up being a dream that came to fruition. Instead, somehow, through a fortuitous series of events, as he saw it, he ended up as the director of the Natural History Department at the British Museum of Natural History in London. He apparently was a person who accepted the old false concept that Linnaeus had put out of the fixity of species. And he was violently opposed to the concept of organic evolution. He was a strict creationist. He wrote and spoke often during his lifetime against Charles Darwin and the Origin of Species book that he published. In the year 1860, he would be the one who would coach on the Bishop of the Church of England from Oxford, Bishop Samuel Wilberforce in a debate with Sir Thomas Henry Huxley that I will give you great details about in just a moment that was one of the landmarks in the history of evolution. Richard Owen was the one who coached Bishop Wilberforce. During the latter part of the 18th century, the name of James Hutton became very familiar in the halls of science. 1726 to 1797, and I'm giving you these dates not because I expect you to remember them specifically, but because they give you the way that we're traveling. They show you who was a contemporary of whom, and I think will allow you to, to fit all these things together in your own mind better. Professor C.R. Longwell once stated that Hutton's greatest contribution was this, the formulation of the uniformitarian principle. Uniformitarianism, that great big long jaw-breaking word which simply means this, and I'm now quoting still from Professor Longwell. It states that natural agents now at work on and within the earth 
operated with general uniformity through immensely long periods of time. In other words, the concept of uniformitarianism says that present processes are sufficient to account for the geologic phenomena that you see in the earth today. Hutton had a, a conclusion that he reached during his lifetime. He said, we find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. His concept became known by a trite catchphrase that you will see even in the literature today. The present is the key to the past. It's interesting to note that Hutton was a medical doctor who left medicine to dabble in agriculture and ended up in geology of sorts. He's known as the father of uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past. Now, though I'll not be the one giving you the lectures dealing with Genesis and geology, you're going to see very quickly when you get into Genesis and geology the importance of James Hutton's work and the concept that he has saddled geologists with and evolutionists with in uniformitarianism. There were two men who carried on the work that was originally done by Hutton. A German by the name of A.G. Werner, W-E-R-N-E-R, -E -E 1749 to 1817, He's the one who became famous for what is now called the onion coat theory of the, of the earth, which stated that the various strata of the earth appear in what we would call concentric shells, uh, like you put one egg and then another egg on top of it and an egg on top of that. It was just concentric shells. We know, of course, today that concept is not right, but he was the one who began to develop it. And an Englishman by the name of William Smith, who lived from 1769 to 1839, taught that fossils occurred in definite strata or layers and in a definite order. He even had a nickname that was given to him because of his work. His nickname was Strata Smith, and that's how he's known in the literature. Geology was not his training. He was trained as an engineer. To Smith goes the credit for establishing the concept that you will be discussing in this seminar in the lectures entitled Genesis and Geology called Index Fossils. And again, I cannot stress to you how urgent and important these index fossils are in the whole of the concept of evolution. He said that you could identify the age and the placement of certain fossils that would then serve as an index for each layer of the earth. And I don't want to steal any of Trevor Major's thunder at this point, but I think it's quite obvious to everyone that if you've got these index fossils and they're based on the idea of simple to complex, older to younger, the whole then of the idea is based on the concept of evolution from beginning to end. And he will have more to say about that later. We're now up to a gentleman who becomes a star in this concert. Erasmus Darwin, 1731 to 1802. He was the grandfather of Charles Darwin. He was an extremely famous and very wealthy medical doctor. He was an outspoken atheist. He was a very prolific writer. His most famous work was a work by the name of Zoonamia, Z-O-O-N-A-M-I-A. It was a two-volume set, the first volume of which was published in 1794. It was in this work and in subsequent, wor subsequent works that he set forth, and I want this underlined in your mind, in no uncertain terms, the basic theory of evolution which his grandson would propound 150 years later. It was in written form, it was in his books, it was amply known and widely distributed. He even used the word evolution to describe it. Professor C.D. Darlington, writing in Scientific American some time ago, said this, Erasmus Darwin orig originated almost every important idea that has since appeared in evolutionary theory. But of course, you and I both know that Erasmus Darwin wasn't the first one to do that. Buffon had done it a hundred years before.
even anticipating genetics as well. <clears throat> Erasmus Darwin's works included all of the major aspects which were to be employed by men who were to follow him many years later. And yet seldom will you ever see his name in any of the credits. And if I were to ask for a show of hands, which I'll not do, how many of you in reading of this have ever read anything that Erasmus Darwin con uh, contributed to the concept of evolution? You may have heard his name. He may have been mentioned patronizingly in passing as, why well, he was Charles Darwin's grandfather. But could you name his works and did you know that he had all the basic concepts of evolution in them already as early as 1794? Probably not. Yet seldom uh, is he given credit and four years after his basic ideas appeared in Zoonamia, Thomas Malthus, the British minister that I'm about to discuss, developed one of its ideas into his Essays on Population. Nine years after Zoonamia's appearance, Lamarck came along and expounded a theory of evolution based on an argument that Erasmus Darwin had regarding use and disuse of organs, and we'll have more to say about that momentarily. Seventy years later, Charles Darwin would come along and write a book on sexual selection, borrowing the ideas that were eventually found in his grandfather's books, but never with a word one as to where he got the idea from. Among the men who eventually would influence Charles Darwin was the British minister that I've already mentioned twice, a political economist as well, Thomas Malthus, 1766 to 1834. The Malthus is M-A-L-T-H-U-S. In 1789, Thomas Malthus published his work called An Essay on the Principle of Population. And in that, in that essay, he insisted that humanity's miseries arose from, now get this, man's fertility linked with his frivolous ways of life. Now that may sound an odd combination to you, but this thing hit the world in which he was living, especially in the aura in which England was existing at that time, with a real smack in the face. He pointed out that natural populations of plants and animals demonstrated that natural reproduction is stronger than all of the potential for maintaining life. In short, reproductive potential exceeds the resources that are available. Malthus thus argued that the nature of reproduction produces a geometric increase in the number of individuals in any given species, whereas the food resources tend to remain constant. The population goes up, the food stays the same. As a result, Malthus took that from the natural populations, applied it to man, and came up with this concept. He attempted to show that the increase in numbers is indeed geometric in nature, while man's food support base, even with technological improvement, only increases at an arithmetical rate. So he concluded, men are doomed to increasing misery as starvation becomes inevitable among the poor social classes. This basic concept, look at it just a minute that excessive fertility provided larger number of expendable individuals in balanced nature was all that Charles Darwin needed. It was to be the basis of his concept of survival of the fittest. And it all came from a British minister and political economist who said that men's food supply can't keep up with their reproduction rate. Listen to what Darwin himself said. In October 1838, I happened to read for amusement Malthus's On Population, and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence which everywhere goes on from long continued observation of the habits of animals and plants, it at once struck me that under those circumstances, favorable variations tend to be preserved. 
and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. The result would be the formation of new species. Here then, I had a theory from which to work. I'm going to keep pressing this point home, not to belittle Charles Darwin, but to make the point clear. If you've read The Origin of Species, did you ever read any credits given to Malthus? No. Or to Erasmus Darwin? No. Or to Buffon? No. There was another man who would eventually follow hot on the trails of Thomas Malthus to give you, I'm sorry, to give Charles Darwin the last little push that he needed in his career. He was an Englishman by the name of Charles Lyell, L-Y-E-L-L, who lived from 1797 to 1875. Lyell was a, was a lawyer, not a geologist or a biologist or a scientist of any kind. Hutton, you'll remember, had originated the concept of uniformitarianism. You may remember Lyell for the one who took it, ran with it, and made it popular. Today he's known as the father of historical geology. In the beginning of the 19th century, let me remind you that geology was a dangerous science because theological influence was extremely strong. Pressure was strong to avoid at all costs a conflict with religion. Catastrophism and progressionism were very popular and were formidable opponents. It was in this atmosphere that Sir Charles Lyell came. He published in 1830 the first volume of a book that would become as famous as The Origin of Species. It was called Principles of Geology. In a letter on January the 15th, 1829, he wrote of his book the following. It will not pretend to give even an abstract of all that is known in geology, but it will endeavor to establish the principle of the reasoning in science. And all my geology will come, will come in as illustration of my views on those principles and as evidence strengthening the system necessarily arising out of the admission of such principles, which, as you know, and listen to this carefully, are that neither more or less than that no causes whatever, no causes whatever, have from the earliest time to which we can look back to the present ever acted except those now acting. And that they never acted with different degrees of energy from that which they now exert. Now you'd be hard pressed to find a clearer definition of uniformitarianism than that. He wanted it clear. He had taken Hutton's concept of no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. This thing has been going on like this since time immemorial. What you see is what you get and what you will always have. And the processes you now see are the processes that have forever and ever and will forever and forever continue to work. It is nothing short of amazing in my estimation that the man who gave Charles Darwin the much-needed push, the impetus for the formulation of his own theory of evolution was, at least for the largest part of his life, a strong believer in God. In a letter to Charles Darwin on May the 5th, 1869, this is 39 years after the publication of his book, I remind you, he said, I rather hail Wallace's suggestion, that's a reference to Alfred Russell Wallace, whom I'll mention shortly, that there may be a supreme will and power which may not abdicate its function of interference but may guide the forces and laws of nature. 39 years after the publication of his book he still believed in God. Now it's true that later in his life, shortly before his death, he gave up much of his belief in God. But he wrote the book and continued to defend the, the book while believing in God for most of his life. Though he accepted the supreme will, this God, he did not necessarily believe in the Bible. 
In fact, in eight, April of 1829, only a few months before his book was published, he spoke of, quote, driving certain men out of the Mosaic record, end quote. And on June the 14th, 1830, the very year that his book was published, he said of some that they, quote, see at last the mischief and scandal brought on them by Mosaic systems, end quote. Eventually, even Lyle himself came to accept almost every tenet of evolution from beginning to end. In nine editions of his book, The Principles of Geology, he had accepted, at least in modified form, ideas of special creation. But in the tenth edition, as one writer put it, the old theory was formally renounced and the new one taken up. At long last, Lyle was a true evolutionist. He was converted by Darwin, and in fact, he even spoke of, quote, his late conversion to Mr. Darwin's doctrine of natural selection, end quote. Obviously, you'd like to know why I mention him and the impact he had on Charles Darwin. Don't take my word for it, folks. Listen to Charles Darwin himself. He said in his life later, quote, I feel as if my books come half out of Sir Charles, Charles Lyell's brain, end quote. There was not a singular man who had a greater impact on Charles Darwin than Sir Charles Lyell. Yet there was another man who did have an impact. You would have to add him to the list of people like Lyell and Hutton and Malthus. He was a philosopher, not a scientist. His name was Herbert Spencer, 1820 to 1903. You can see now that we've entered into the 20th century. Spencer's works were widely read during his day. Yet today, there are few people who even know his name. He was a confirmed naturalist. In fact, he believed in nature and only nature, so much so that his own father one day said this of him. From what I see of my son's mind, it appears to me that the laws of nature are to him what revealed religion is to us, and that any willful infraction of those laws is to him as much as sin to us, uh, is as much as sin to us as disbelief is what, let me back up and get that right, that any willful infraction of those laws is to him as much as sin as to us disbelief in what is revealed. So he took nature as the law of, quote, God, where we take revealed words for God's law. By his own admission, he was a devout agnostic, and it is to him that we give the credit for the phrase, survival of the fittest. It was from his works that Charles Darwin borrowed that phrase to put into the origin of species. I would add one more time, with no credit given at all. Upon Darwin's publication in 1859 of the book, The Origin of Species, Herbert Spencer became one of his most enthusiastic supporters. For Spencer, as for Darwin, survival of the fittest was the best, it was the only explanation for natural selection, and natural selection was the best, the only explanation for evolution. So the two were inextricably linked. They could not be separated as far as these two men were concerned. But about the time all this was going on, actually just a little earlier, John Baptiste de Lamarck, whose name I've already mentioned, who lived from 1744 to 1829, was also doing some writing. He became famous for a work called Philosophy Zoologique, in other words, the philosophy of zoology. Lamarck went to Paris to study medicine, which he did, but his life's work was not in medicine per se, it was in the fields of biology, botany, and zoology. He became famous for this work and is known in a limited sense, says Dr. Dobzhansky of the Rockefeller University, as a founder of evolutionary theory. Only in a limited sense for the following reason. Lamarck's the one who saddled us with the concept we now know of acquired characteristics or well, I guess that's the best term for it, acquired traits or acquired characteristics. Now, the quotation I'm about to give you is rather lengthy, but 
it quotes from Lamarck's own works. And I'm going to give it to you because it so adequately explains exactly what Lamarck was trying to get over. The quotation is from Byron Nelson. Observing the everyday fact that if a man uses his arm vigorously for a time as a blacksmith does, the arm becomes larger. And if he does not use the arm, but sits physically idle in an office, as does a clerk, the arm becomes smaller. Lamarck thought he had found a solution to the problem of the origin of species. Lamarck said, quote, the remote ancestors of present day forms were always being induced by the conditions in which they lived to use certain parts of their bodies more than others. Those parts that were used became larger those parts not used became smaller. The effects of the use and disuse of these parts were passed on to the offspring. They were slightly different from their parents. In turn, the offspring themselves were then caused uh, were by conditions in their environment to use one part more and another part less. The results in them of this use or disuse of parts were still further passed on. Thus, changes in the offspring imparted to them by the very use or disuse of parts by the parents were steadily accumulating through the centuries. And by their accumulation, living forms were continually undergoing a process of transformation." End quote. Now, Mr. Nelson goes on to say, to make this explanation of a difficult problem clearer, a few concrete examples had best be taken out of Lamarck's book. Taking the case of the giraffe with its long neck, Lamarck explains it in the following manner. And the reason I'm going to give you this is because it does so well explain what Lamarck was trying to get over. The remote ancestors of the giraffe had short necks, as does the cow or the horse. Along came a drought and dried up all of the vegetation on the ground. Leaves remained on the trees, however, for some inexplicable reason. <laughs> For these leaves, the short-necked ancestors reached, and in so doing, they stretched their necks. Then they had offspring, and the offspring showed in themselves the effects of their parents stretching. The necks of the offspring were imperceptibly longer than their parents. Imperceptibly longer, but longer. The offspring grew up. Along fortuitously came another drought, which dried up the grass on the ground, but left leaves on the trees. For these leaves, the ancestors stretched their necks. When their young were born, they showed the effects of their parents stretching, their necks were still longer, and so on. By the steady accumulation through thousands of years of the effects upon the neck of stretching for leaves, the present long neck of the giraffe came into being." End quote. And that's directly from Lamarck. That's the concept, of course, of acquired characteristics or the concept of use and disuse. I've always found it interesting why no one thought to ask Lamarck at the time, and perhaps someone did in history, just didn't record it, why it is the females of the species have much shorter necks and the males have longer ones. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's the case. Now, this doctrine had its ardent supporters, but it also had its ardent opponents. Question. Uh, we can assume from all these things you've been pointing out as far as the profession of these people, that these individuals were, are guilty of the very thing that the evolution is keeping us up today, you know, speaking in areas that we have no training. We talk about lawyers, medical doctors, uh, which their theories are based all this stuff on. Very profound, considered very, I guess, influential. Yet today, if we step out of our bounds to speak in an area like that, and we are uh, you know, ridiculed for that. That's the very point I'm trying to make. And I had myself a little note here, just a summary, to when I got to the end of this, to say, and I'll stop and just say it now, you're well aware that we indeed have been criticized. In fact, I'm beginning to wonder if there's any area that a creationist can be in that he can criticize evolution from. Uh, the evolutionist has said, well, you know, if you're in microbiology, that doesn't have anything to do. You can't criticize us from that. And if you're, in, uh, if you're in engineering, you certainly can't criticize us from that. And if you're in physics, well, don't criticize because only the biologists could criticize us. And you don't have any biologists, so be quiet. Well, it's interesting that the criticism like that, in fact, one of the strong...
critics of those of us who are creationists being critics of evolution has come from people like Dr. John Patterson of Iowa State University who himself is an engineer <laughs> and a foremost evolutionist. Our immediate rebuttal to that is the point you've already picked up on. And it was not by accident. I was trying to gently and subtly stress it to you by giving you simply these occupations. You've got Hutton, a medical doctor. You've got William Stratus Smith, an engineer. You've got Erasmus Darwin, a medical doctor. Malthus, a minister. Lyell, a lawyer. Spencer, a philosopher. Do you see any biologists in there anywhere? The very people who founded the concept of modern day evolution, there wasn't a one of them who was a biologist. And yet we've been criticized for criticizing them when we're not trained, some of us say, in just the field of biology. If the folks that can formulate it were outside the fields in which it was formulated, it certainly seems fair the folks that could criticize it could be the same. And that was my point. The doctrine of acquired characteristics had its opponents, yes. It also had its supporters. Interestingly, at one point in his life, Darwin was a formidable opponent of Lamarckianism. He said, in fact, and I quote, heaven forfend me from, da from Lamarck's nonsense, end quote. And lo and behold, he turned right around and in subsequent editions of The Origin of Species made it the basis for the book. Many people are not aware of why. A Scotsman by the name of Fleming Jenkin had criticized Darwin in the pages of the North British Review, and I'm deviating from my text, but on purpose. And Fleming Jenkins took Darwin to task for this concept of natural selection and said natural selection cannot do what you're saying that it's doing. Basically, Jenkins said what Hugo de Vries would say 50 years later. De Vries said, the Dutch botanist who literally invented genetics for us, natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. And later, in one of his letters, which is in the small book you have, Darwin would say, Fleming Jenkin has given me no little trouble and at last has convinced me. It was because of Darwin's giving up on natural selection and natural selection alone that he switched over in later editions of The Origin to Lamarckianism. At one point he said, heaven forfend me from that nonsense, and the next point he's making it the basis of the book. Why? Because he had nothing better. But August Weissmann, the German scientist whom I mentioned a moment ago, W-E-I-S-M-A-N-N, -N, who lived from 1835 to 1914, himself an evolutionist, took Lamarck's idea and tried it. And he cut off the tails of white mice and then bred them. Well, I'd call that a disuse if you had somebody cut off your tail. And he bred them and the tails still had, uh, the mice still had tails. So he cut them off and they still had tails and he cut them off. He did that for 19 consecutive generations and then gave up. <laughs> and of course, because of his work, we discovered that it's not pan genes. It's not acquired characteristics. It's somatic or body cells and germ cells. You've got to alter the germ cells. And that, of course, led us into genetics. If you don't change the genetics of it, you're going to get exactly what you've always gotten. Use and disuse doesn't work. On January the 8th of 1823, in a Welsh village, a male child was born that would eventually change the future of the whole world and never even know what he had done. And no, it wasn't Charles Darwin. It was Alfred Russell Wallace. He left home when he was 14, became a naturalist in his own right. He took trips to Brazil and to Borneo. And it was from the Dutch Indies in the summer of 1858 that he made his impression on the world and never even knew it. He was lying in a grass hut on a cot dying, he thought, of intermittent yellow fever when he penned an essay entitled On the Tendencies of Varieties to Depart from the Original Type. It was that very same essay he sent to Charles Darwin, his good friend and associate naturalist, with a letter in which he said, I hope, Sir Charles, 
This essay meets your eyes with as much glee and joy as it has met mine. The messenger rapped on Darwin's door, handed him the treaties, and Darwin had no sooner read it than he said, and I quote, all of my originality will be smashed. I never saw a more striking coincidence, end quote. Alfred Russell Wallace had beat him to the punch. He had the concept of natural selection and survival of the fittest down to the last dotting of the I and crossing of the T. Here is a man, Charles Darwin, who had, as you'll see momentarily, spent over 20 years of his life working on this singular concept. And an old, gray-headed, bearded fella, dying of yellow fever, he thought, in the Dutch Indies, in a grass hut on a cot, beats him to it. Darwin was devastated. But he called his two friends, Sir Charles Lyell and Dr. Joseph Hooker, a medical doctor, and asked their advice, sought their counsel. They said, ask Wallace for permission to read his paper at the upcoming meeting in the summer of 1858 at the Linnaean Society. Write Dr. Asa Gray, the medical doctor from Harvard. Darwin had written Dr. Gray before, and in a private letter, in September, I believe it was, of 1857, had lined out for Gray his basic concept. He said, write Gray, see if he's still got the letter. It's got the date on it. He has it. He can verify you sent it to him. You can at least say that you had it first. You just hadn't published it. Darwin wrote to Dr. Gray, and Dr. Gray had that letter, sent it kindly back to Darwin. Darwin used it to establish that he did at least think of this in the summer and uh, the fall of 1857. In July of 1858, on July the 1st, in fact, the two papers of these two men were read before the Linnaean Society. Wallace was still in Borneo. Darwin wasn't even there. He was home nursing a sick child. No one knew what was about to happen. The two papers were read. There was hardly any discussion. And yet those two papers were about to rock the world to its very foundation. It was only a few short months later. In fact, November the 24th of 1859 that The Origin of Species was published as the result of the reading of those two papers. What was to have been a multi-volume set published by Charles Darwin became, in haste, reduced down to only one volume. Upon its release that day, over 100 years ago, 1,025 copies were released for publication by the publishers, and by 5 o'clock of that day, they were every one gone. Over the next 17 years, it was published in 16,000 copies, an amazing feat for any singular book. Darwin, of course, himself came from a whole string of medical doctors. His father, Robert, his grandfather, Erasmus, were both medical doctors. He was sent to, to medical school at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. His mother was, in fact, the uh, daughter of Josiah Wedgwood. And you women in here will, of course, immediately notice Wedgwood pottery. They were very renowned and quite wealthy. Darwin was sent to medical school. When in the first day they were operating on a cadaver, he couldn't handle it. He ran from the room screaming and vomiting and never returned. So his father sent him to law school. Darwin flunked out of law school. His father was in desperation. His mother was a fairly religious woman. She insisted the father gave in. He ended up going to, to Cambridge, where he finally, through great difficulty, earned a degree. And it may surprise some of you to learn the only degree that Darwin ever held was in religion. During his schooling in theology, he pursued some independent studies in sciences, and as a result of some influences of some of his professors, was sent on the voyage of the Beagle, which would later become the title of one of his books. Leaving in 1831, the month of December, the Beagle left for a five-year trip to collect in, uh, scientific information for Her Majesty's laboratories. During the voyage, he read Malthus's essay on population and Sir Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology. The young man was never the same. The obvious question is, why did the world jump at Darwin? George Bernard Shaw, I think, per perhaps puts it best when he says, if you can realize how insufferably, insufferably the world was oppressed by...
that everything that happened was an arbitrary personal act of an arbitrary personal God of dangerous, jealous, and cruel personal character, you will understand how the world jumped at Darwin. Religion in Darwin's day and time was in a horrible situation. And the world was ready for something different, and Darwin gave them something different. Darwin never admitted the influence that others had on him. With the exception of Lyell, he never gave credit to anyone else. Much of his work was nothing more than a rehashing of others. Spencer, Malthus, Buffon, his own grandfather, to name just a few. But yet, notice what Dr. Simpson says of Harvard. Darwin himself wrote, quote, He never happened to come across a single naturalist who seemed to doubt about the permanence of species, end quote. In other words, he didn't know anybody else who believed that species changed. He was the only one. He said, uh, Dr. Simpson says he acknowledged no debt to his predecessors, and these are indeed extraordinary statements. They cannot, says Dr. Simpson, himself an evolutionist, be literally true. Yet Darwin cannot consciously be lying. And he therefore must be judged either unconsciously misleading, naive, or forgetful, or just all three. <laughs> His own grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, whose work Charles knew very well, was a pioneer evolutionist. Darwin was also familiar with the work of Lamarck, formed part of his book on him, I should say he was, and had certainly met a few naturalists who had flirted with the idea of evolution. Of all this, Darwin says none of these forerunners had any effect on him. Then, still quoting Simpson, in almost the next breath, he admits that hearing evolutionary views supported and praised rather early in his life may have favored his upholding them later." End quote. Some will ask, well, where did Darwin's belief in God fit into all of this? I'll let Darwin answer that for you. I was unwilling to give up my belief. I feel sure of this, for I can well remember often and often inventing daydreams of old letters between distinguished Romans and manuscripts being discovered at Pompeii or elsewhere which confirmed in the most striking manner all that was written in the Gospels. But I found it more and more difficult, with free scope given to my imagination, to invent evidence which would suffice to convince me. Thus disbelief crept over me at such a slow rate, but at last was complete. The rate was so slow, I felt no distress. Of course, one of Darwin's defenders, and I'm going to have to hurry if I conclude in time, was Sir Thomas Henry Huxley. Inducted as a fellow into the Royal Society of England at the age of 26, he was a brilliant medical doctor, an even more brilliant orator, golden-tongued if there ever was one. In 1860, the summer, he participated in a debate with the Bishop of England, Samuel Wilberforce. The bishop strode to the platform, having been coached by Richard Owen, the anatomist and creationist we've already mentioned, and he began into a tirade against Charles Darwin, who was not even present at the time. Huxley was seated on the front row before him, and it was at this point that the bishop made his fatal and famous error. He turned to Huxley and said something to this effect. Since you assert you come from an ape, would you stand up and tell this august society, this was occurring before the Linnaean society, would you please tell everyone, I'm sorry, I said Linnaean society, that should have been the British Association for the Advancement of Science, would you please tell this august society from which side was it you descended on the ape, from your grandmother's side or your grandfather's side? and the audience erupted into gales of laughter at Huxley's expense. Huxley said nothing. He sat quietly and stone-faced, turned to the fellow sitting next to him, and just as the laughter died down, was overheard to say, Ah, surely, the Lord has delivered him into my hands. The bishop sat down. Huxley arose, walked to the platform, looked at the audience, addressed the bishop, and said something to this effect. My dear bishop, were you to give me the choice this day of having been descended from the lowly ape or having been created by an omniscient, omnibenevolent, omnipotent creator 
but yet using the wit and wisdom given to me by such a creator to bring mockery and ridicule into the midst of such a serious and objective scientific search for truth, be assured I should surely choose the ape. And you could have heard a pin drop. And from that day forward, Huxley was known as the Bishop Eater. <laughs> and Wilberforce lost the debate, and creationism from that point forward suffered immeasurably. You're probably aware that the very next thing that happened, of course, as far as any consequence, and I'm going to have to leave out some of the doings with Dr. Asa Gray and Dr. Louis Agassiz. Dr. Gray, I will simply say, for the record, was a a theistic evolutionist and a big supporter of Darwin, but never going as far as Darwin wanted him to go. Dr. Louis Agassiz, the Swiss-born MD, PhD from Harvard, was a renowned opponent of Darwinism and a brilliant speaker. He was the American equivalent to Sir Thomas Henry Huxley, traveled all over the country lecturing against Darwinism and had filled audit auditoriums to capacity. But the real crucial role in our country was in 1925. The state of Tennessee had just passed the Butler Act, which said this, in part, It shall be unlawful to teach any theory that denies the story of divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man descended from a lower order of animals. That, of course, forbade the teaching of evolution. He simply could not teach evolution. No one could in Tennessee state schools. The ACLU challenged that law, a suit was filed. They provided the best lawyer's money could buy, literally. Clarence Darrow, the famed agnostic, with his associates Arthur Garfield Hayes and Dudley Field Malone. John Thomas Scopes was the young high school teacher, a coach and substitute biology teacher on rare occasions by his own admission in his autobiography, published in 1967, The Center of the Storm. Mr. Scopes was thrown on trial, Clarence Darrow was brought in to defend him. The prosecuting team was no less renowned. William Jennings Bryan Sr., three times Democratic nominee for the presidency of the United States, Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson, and Bible-believing fundamentalist. His son, William Jennings Bryan Jr., and the Attorney General of the state of Tennessee, Mr. Arthur T. Stewart. July the 10th, 1925, the trial began. In the, class, in the courtroom of Judge Ralston in the Ray County Courthouse in Scope in Dayton, Tennessee. And though I'll not have time to give you the whole as I had hoped to do, at least in part, you were aware that Mr. Scope was found guilty, which was no surprise because Mr. Darrow, his defense attorney, had pleaded with the jury to find his client guilty. That may shock you some. I'm sure it did Mr. Scopes sitting there hearing his <laughs> attorney ask that he be found guilty. But it was no secret. Mr. Darrow wanted to take it to the United States Supreme Court. He didn't get his wish. He was found guilty, Mr. Scopes was, but the judge, Judge Ralston, made a legal tactical error. He fined Mr. Scopes $100. The Baltimore Sun paid that fine, the newspaper. But the judge couldn't do that according to Tennessee law. For some reason, unknown to us, he made an error. Tennessee law said any fine over $50 had to be assigned by the judge. It was uh, assigned by the jury. He assigned it, and it was more than $50, and he wasn't the jury, so that at the appellate court level, the thing was overturned, and the Butler Act was allowed to stay on the books. John Thomas Scopes, however, was found innocent. Several years later, the state of Tennessee, upon seeing that it was about to have another Scopes trial, 1967, struck down the Butler Act and threw it off the books. One year later, November the 12th, 1968, the United States Supreme Court struck down all laws across all states that forbade the teaching of evolution. You're also aware, I'm sure, that in the early parts of the 1980s, in fact, March the 19th, 1981, Governor Frank White of the state of Arkansas signed a law that was called Law Act 590 that mandated the teaching of both creation and evolution in public schools in the state of Arkansas. On May the 27th, just eight days later, the ACLU filed suit again, stating the law was a violation of the First Amendment, the separation of church and state. On December the 7th, 1981, federal judge William Overton released his opinion, stating the bill was, in fact, as he saw it, unconstitutional 
the Attorney General of the state of Arkansas, Steve Clark, himself thinking the law never to be any good in the first place, chose not to appeal it, and it died. But during that time, in fact, on July the 7th, 1981, the state of Louisiana passed a similar, though not exactly the same kind of law. And these dates and the documentation are in the green book we've given you, Scopes to the Great Debate. Governor Dave Treen signed the bill into law. The ACLU on December the 3rd, 1981, filed suit to challenge that law, stating they would, fi they would file suit against any law in any state that tried to teach any concept of creation. You're probably aware that this particular um, law was found by Judge Adrian Duplantier in Louisiana to be unconstitutional. However, the Attorney General, Mr. William Goost, decided to appeal that to a tribunal, a three-member board of the 15-member appellate court. That board struck it down again. Mr. Goost, not content, appealed it to the entire 15-member appellate court, and it was struck down again, but only by the most narrow of margins, eight to seven. And the seven-member dissenters wrote a stinging minority opinion that ridiculed not allowing the teaching of creation into the schools. Armed with that minority dissenting opinion, Mr. Goost appealed it to the United States Supreme Court. On December the 10th, 1986, not even one year ago, the, the court heard those arguments. You're, I'm sure, well aware that on June the 19th, 1987, the United States Supreme Court, by a 7-2 vote, struck down the Louisiana law and in effect has said that from this point forward in public schools supported by tax monies, there will be no concepts of creation taught by law. What the future will hold as a result of what we have discussed this morning, I'm not prepared to say. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but it's certainly safe to say that this controversy, rather than diminishing, will now be extremely increased. And you're going to see a further polarization of the two camps, there is no doubt of that at all. They cannot, the two ideas of creation and evolution, peacefully coexist. Controversy is going to surround them no matter where they are as long as time goes on. And I hope the lecture this morning will have been some help to you in seeing the concepts that have been developed and how they've been developed. You may wonder why we've devoted an hour and 15 minutes to just the history. But I wanted you to know this history because the remainder of the lectures that you're going to hear on Genesis and geology, the compromises of Genesis, biological evolution, are going to draw on all of these facts and try to piece them together in a beautiful mosaic the rest of the week for you. We'll dismiss now and uh, you can take a break and we'll reconvene at 1045.